as mayor of the city of Stanton, I call the work session for January 13th, 2022 to order at 5 p.m. The first item is a consideration of work session and regular meeting. Let me take a step backwards because yep. we have um, a visiting clerk for us. So at this time, I'll entertain a motion to appoint our acting clerk of council. Madam Mayor. Councilor Clappy. I move that Kim Cormier be appointed as acting clerk of council for the recordation of the proceedings of council at its work session and regular meeting of January 13, 2022, and that she be authorized and directed to sign and execute such documents as are necessary and proper regarding the presence of council members, a quorum, consideration, and voting. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. We have a second by Councilor Holmes. Any further discussion? Hearing none, who is our, who's going to take the role? Mr. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that, Madam Mayor. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Council Member Clappy? Aye. All right. The motion is passed. Welcome, Ms. Cormier. Glad to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, filling in tonight for us. Now, Madam Mayor, you want to proceed to deal with the remote participation. Yes, I've got it right here. Thank you. On January 10th, 2022, I received a request from Councillor Dole to participate remotely in the January 13th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a family member's medical condition that prevents her physical attendance at the meeting. I will now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Dole's remote participation in the meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three, I move to allow Councilor Dull to remotely participate in the January 13th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a temporary medical condition. Um, I, I apologize, Madam Mayor. Uh, Vice Mayor Robertson, could you say, state that it's due to a family member's temporary medical All condition? Right. Having said, uh, uh, we'll change that last part to a meeting due to a uh, family member's temporary medical condition. All right, thank you. So there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor I Oaks. second it. Who, who second that? Friend. Councilor Mead, second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Excuse me, I, but I don't I, think Ms. Mead voted. My apologies. Ms. Mead. Aye. Motion passes. All right. Councillor Dole. Can you please state from what remote location you are participating in tonight's meeting? Ms. Dole, you're on mute. I thought you could read lips. <laughs> 1003 East Beverly Street, Stanton. All right, could everyone on city council as well as the audience here, Councillor Dole? Yes. yes. All right, welcome. All right takes us to the next item, which is the first item on the work session agenda, a consideration of work session and regular meeting agendas. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Councilor Darby. Uh, I would like to move to amend tonight's regular meeting agenda to add a closed session to discuss personnel issues related to the city manager and matters from the public and I ask that the city attorney prepare a closed meeting motion necessary to go into that session. Right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks, I, I, I hate to um, break in again, but Ms. Darby, you, you said something about matters from the public. To go into it at the end of the regular work session okay. after matters from the public. Okay at the end of the meeting yes okay 
Ma Madam, is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. A point of clarification. Um, Mr. Blair, is that motion uh, proper? After yeah. matters from the public. Right. Yes. Okay. All right. So there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I'll second that. We have a second. Any further discussion? Uh, yes, this is Carolyn Dole. Um, I would like to also add um, uh, 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 something to the work session. So do we, how do we handle that? Uh, uh, Councillor Dole, um, does your amendment relate in any way to what Councillor Darby just stated? No, I have no idea what hers is. <laughs> okay. Well, then if there's no relation between the two amendments, I think the proper procedure is to first take Councillor Darby's amendment and have the council discuss and or vote on it. And then Ms. Dole, if you would introduce your amendment, have the council discussion and vote on it. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Mayor Oaks. Councillor Mead. Uh, having, uh, having heard absolutely nothing, uh, previous to this moment about a about this uh, closed meeting, um, I will not be voting in favor of it. Any further discussion? I feel the same way. You know, I think we should have been all aware of if you were going to call a closed meeting, we should have all been. All right. So I'll vote. No, I'll vote no. Also. All right. This is Carolyn Dull. I. I think it, it's particularly uh, problematic since it's a closed session and we're, we're supposed to uh, be able to vote and certify that what we discussed was properly a closed meeting and we have no clue what it is. So, so I don't know that this is the right, the right time or place to be doing whatever this is, that it should be on, it should be put on to the maybe the next meeting agenda in advance with some uh, communication to us as to what it is. All right, any further discussion? Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Mead? No. Mr. Holmes? No. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dahl? No. Ms. Darby. Aye. The motion carries. Okay. Councillor Dole, did you have? Yes, I would like to add an item and it could be item seven uh, to uh, have a discussion and possible consideration of a uh, emergency declaration. All right, so that would be item eight. Uh, uh, item seven's roll call. Madam Mayor. And that would need to be voted on under the regular meeting. Um, well, my, my only comment, if I may, is that I'm concerned about having sufficient time during the work session to take up the matter that Ms. Dole has, is proposing. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder whether Ms. Dole would be willing to make a, a motion instead to add it to the regular meeting agenda. Yes, I'll amend my original motion to uh, add it to the regular meeting agenda. Okay, and just for a point of clarification, Councillor Dole, what exactly is it that you're requesting? A discussion and possible consideration of an emergency declaration. All right, and that's in a form of a motion. Uh, is there a second? This is Brandon Mead, I'll second it. Right, there's a second on the floor. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson? No. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? No. Mayor Oaks? No. The motion carries. All right. So that is item D on the regular meeting agenda. All right, moving on to item number two, a present, the point of clarification, um, Mr. Blair, 
I don't know that I've actually heard a consideration for the rest of the items. So are we, are we good? <laughs> no, no. Um, there have been two amendments to the agenda, the addition of item D to the regular meeting, as well as a closed meeting after matters from the public. So you need a motion to approve the work session agenda and the regular agenda as amended. Um, Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move that uh, we consider or uh, move Approve. that we uh, pass the uh, work session and regular meeting agendas as uh, amended. amended. So there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. There's a second by Councillor Claffey. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. The motion carries. All right, the next item is item number two, a presentation of the draft FY 2022 through 2026 Capital Improvement Plan. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Phil Trayer, the city's chief finance officer will present this item. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here this evening tonight. We are here to review the 2022 to 2026 proposed CIP plan. As usual, uh, there is a tremendous amount of information packed in this plan, so we will try to summarize the changes for each fund and communicate why the changes were made. With us this evening to assist with questions is Jeff Johnson, Lyle Hart, Pete Kessiger, John Glover, Rodney Rhodes, and Kurt Plowman. Slide two, this year plans total $108,321,981 is broken out as follows. General fund, 61.7 million. School fund, 9.6 million. Water fund, 22.3. Sewer fund, 8.8 .8 million. Stormwater fund, 4.6. And parking fund, 1.4 million. Slide three, as in previous years, the basic framework of the CIP has remained relatively unchanged. We still have reserves for our street projects, sidewalk projects, fire equipment, greenway projects, utility projects, pedestrian paths, oh. and education provisions. Okay. Um, yeah, you're good. Okay. Uh, slides four and five summarizes a five-year plan, which are color-coded to assist with funding source identification. Uh, the first 15 line items identify annual reserves we plan on setting aside to ensure funds are, are available for high dollar projects without disrupting individual budget years. There are nine projects listed on this summary which are VDOT supported. They appear in red shade and they uh, account for nearly $28 million. Uh, and they're, they're on the next slide. Actually, if we go down one, one slide, we'll see those. There's our VDOT projects. Um, <clears throat> We have three projects highlighted in gray, which are slated for bond issuance, totaling 16 million. The Middle River Regional Jail will issue its own bonds and the city will be responsible for its own share, which are represented on this schedule as well. Uh, the fire and public safety provisions are placeholders and cost estimates. Cost estimates will need to be updated as we get closer to the construction. Slide six addresses major changes to the general fund CIP. They include the Stan Sports and the Middle River Regional Jail construction has been scheduled in 23 as this project continues to proceed. Uh, the city hopes to apply a combination of uh, reserve funds and debt service to cover these costs. The police station project originally scheduled for 23 has been removed and replaced with a $10 million placeholder in FY 2026 for public safety and judicial projects. This is truly a placeholder and we will need to update these amounts. Three VDOT funded street projects have been added to 26. They include the Greenville Avenue Road Diet, the Richmond Road and Crossing Projects, and Commerce Road and Lewis Creek Greenway Project. Total cost of the emergency radio system has been consolidated into FY 2022 as the city is tracking for a contract award as early as June 30th, 2022. Previously, the funding provisions were split between 22 and 23. Also, the funding for this project has been updated. Previously, the proposed funding source was via debt. We are now proposing using a combination of fund balance in the amount of $1.6 million and $2 million in ARPA funding. We'll go through the general fund 
uh, year by year. And so you'll see some of these items again in the upcoming slides. Slide seven outlines the 22 plan modifications, uh, three changes here. The emergency radio, as we just mentioned, um, the Bessie Weller Safe Routes to School project cost estimate has been adjusted downward from 800,000 to 527 as per VDOT estimates. Provisions for the Richmond Road Statler Boulevard uh, adjusted upwards to uh, 395, I mean 935, to reflect VDOT's current cost estimate. Originally, this was 623, 623,000. Slide eight covers 23 modifications. The consolidation emergency radio project, as we mentioned, the movement of the police station, as we mentioned. Uh, next, a $350,000 provision for the relocation of the IT department has been redesignated into undesignated CIP for future council consideration. Finally, the Middle River Regional Dale construction, again, scheduled in 23, as mentioned above. Slide nine outlines 24 modifications, which include moving of the $4.5 million provision for the fire station into 2026. We move the Richmond Avenue Road Diet $2.2 million to 26 to align with actual construction start date. We added $100,000 to the installation of lights at the dog park. We removed half a million dollar provision for the jail. We added $200,000 to the installation of pedestrian signals at Beverly and Coulter. And we moved $250,000 maintenance shop relocation provision into 26. On slide 10, we look at FY25's modifications, which include removal of $500,000 provision for the jail, uh, removal of a $250,000 provision for the maintenance shop relocation. Um, this will not be repeated. This one is out permanently. Uh, we moved $1.1 million Edgewood Road sidewalk walk project uh, from North Coulter to North Augusta to 26. We moved $1.5 million North Augusta sidewalk project from Lambert Street to Terry Street to 26. And finally, we moved $1.1 million North Augusta sidewalk project from Terry Street to Meadowbrook Road uh, to 2026. Although VDOT has in most cases already begun their work, placement of these projects again in 26 occurred to try to closely align with the actual project construction date. Uh, people start seeing, folks start seeing projects listed in 23 and 24, although work may have already begun, it will have already begun on the VDOT side, they'll be looking for you know road crews and, and they won't see those until 26. So. Um, slide 11 lists the 26 modifications. Uh, we added provisions for the fire truck replacement reserves, cardiac monitors, and self-contained breathing apparatuses. We added the $4.5 million provision for the firehouse. That will definitely need to be updated as we, as we close in on, on an actual project start date. We added the $10 million provision for public safety judicial projects. Again, that'll need to be updated. We added the street, sidewalk reserves, maintenance, greenways, bike, pedestrian paths, education reserves for Blue Ridge Community College and city schools. And we added the maintenance shop relocation, $250,000 provision. Y12 continues 26. We have the scheduling of the previously mentioned road projects from VDOT. And we added this, uh, the sidewalk projects as we mentioned above. Um, Slide 13, unfunded and unscheduled. The core of the unfunded and unscheduled projects has remained largely unsaid, uh, unchanged. That said, during the CIP process, we added numerous requests from staff for proposed CIP projects. We added these projects at the beginning of the section and they are the first six items listed and they total $7.3 million. These projects were also requested for consideration of ARPA funds. They include um, Gypsy Hill Park bathroom replacements, 700,000. Fire apparatus replacements, $1.6 million. This would replace two 20 year plus old units within the fire department, very old units. Uh, Moxley Stadium renovation, 1.5. Gypsy Hill Park practice field lights, 250,000. Gypsy Hill Park clubhouse renovation, 750,000. Streetscape water line replacement, Greenville Avenue entryway, $2.5 million. On slide 14, we report the removal of the $15 million provision for the Middle River Regional Dale construction, as again, this was is, is scheduled for 23. 
Uh, finally, we re we re looked at the uh, city's 2004 streetscape plan. We updated the plan with revised estimates, added projected waterline replacement costs where applicable, and included these projects in the unfunded, unscheduled section. The streetscape projects estimates are listed at the end of the section, and they're the last nine items appearing on the slide. Slide 15 is a summary of uh, VDOT six-year plans. And if you look at those dates, you can, can, can see uh, when VDOT work is actually scheduled to begin. So some of it has already begun. Uh, Stanton Crossing Extension, uh, the Richmond Avenue Road Diet, um, Richmond Avenue Crossing Way, and the Commerce Road. These projects have already begun on the VDOT side. We just won't see construction for a few years yet. So, um, slide 16, we'll begin with the schools. Overall, the FY 2022 CIP plan for schools equals $3,575,000, includes annual reserves for mechanical roof and generator replacement, 100, uh, 100,000. School parking pavement reserves of 100,000. $250,000 is added per year for work to enhance CTE-related programs for secondary education, $50,000 reserves for maintenance vehicles, $25,000 for furniture replacement, and we have a combined total of $3,050,000 provision for school storage and maintenance shop relocation. Slide 17, we have 23's education CIP plan. That totals $3,450,000. It includes provisions for the school bus replacement, furniture, maintenance vehicles, ground equipment, mechanical roofs and generators, technology reserves, paving of parking lots, CTE improvements. In addition, the schools have a $2.5 million provision for the Shelburne CTE renovations and a $1.2 million provision for additional student space at the Shelburne Middle School. Having been involved in CIP processes in other school systems, middle school physical plants are often the choke point in building capacity, and it's no different here in Stanton. This is the reason why the schools are so heavily focused on this school. Another point that needs to be made at this time is that we, the city and the schools, need to begin to think, and think more along the lines of the impact on the school's student population and city departments for each additional housing projects that come online. The city and schools would, would both be well served to initiate a study either internally or externally that will provide some guidance on how the city and schools will be impacted as the city continues to grow. A recent example is affordable housing on Middlebrook Avenue. Traditionally, multifamily housing will incorporate a younger family with younger children. This means an immediate impact on Bessie Weller. Conversely, single family home additions like what we're seeing at the old South subdivision are often occupied by older families with older children, which will disproportionately impact secondary schools. So as the city continues to grow, we will keep an eye on how this will impact the schools in the city's departments. Slide 18, funding reserves for the schools remain constant through uh, 24 and 26, with the exception of CTE reserve funding in 24, which will go towards a middle school CTE facility improvement. Remaining uh, year's reserves comprised of uh, transportation, furniture, mechanical equipment, IT, paving, and CTE. Singular non-recurring projects totaling $6,750,000, uh, $750,000 appear in the school CIP. It's the warehouse, the Shelburne CTE, and the Shelburne student meeting space. These projects will undergo further vetting and cost estimates will be revised as needed. Finally, there's one major project that remains unfunded and unscheduled with the schools, and that's the renovation of the Dixon Education Center in the amount of $25 million. This is up from $15 million as uh, uh, staff wanted to ensure that the inflationary costs as well as outer year inflation costs um, are taken into consideration. So they asked to have that updated to 25 million. Slide 19. Stormwater. Uh, stormwater has seen multiple changes to it as staff has reprioritized projects in order to provide the city with maximum impact on stormwater mitigation, as well as reducing runoff, com runoff contamination. 
Year on year changes include the addition of the installation of rain gauges to monitor water levels within the city, 40,000. In 23, we added a biodetention pond and stream restoration project between Garland Drive and Hickory Street for $900,000. We added the Men's Thumb Park Pollution Reduction, 50,000. We moved the Gypsy Hill Stream restoration, res restoration to 24, that's 1.2 million. We removed miscellaneous stormwater improvements to 50,000, and we removed the Tams Carolina Augusta Storm Drain Project, the amount of $600,000. On slide 20, we finished up changes in stormwater in 24. We added the Gypsy Hill uh, Stream restoration from 2023 on the amount of $1.2 million. The funding for this project as it stands right now is to be determined. Cash reserves um, are not projected to be available to cover these at this time. So we'll have to see how FY23's projects um, shape up. And if we have some savings there, uh, we, we, we may be able to pull that off in 24. If not, we, we, we may have to modify the scheduling or look for other funding sources. Um, and finally, in 24, we removed the Green Hill Industrial Park Basin retrofits, $1.3 million. Yeah. This item actually needs to be added to the unfunded mandated project list. So we'll get that updated and it will appear in that section in the final version of the CIP. <clears throat> in FY25, we removed the Pocahontas Campbell Drain Project of $995,000. We added the village's Asylum Creek restoration of 1.4 million. In 26, we added the Stanton High School stream restoration of $1 million. Um, unfunded and unscheduled has been reduced. And for the most part, only the mandated projects remain on the list. That said, we do have two flood study related projects that appear on page 48 of the CIP. And they con that consists of an estimated $300,000 for flood shields and $650,000 for tunnel maintenance. These two projects are potential candidates for ARPA funding, and they're not officially classified as mandated projects from a regulatory sense. Slide 21, changes to the water fund. Um, in FY22, we moved the Shutterly Mill tank painting and repair project of $250,000 into 22 from 2021. This project became a priority after inspections indicated preventive maintenance was necessary to maintain the tank. We adjusted the Clearwell tank repair provision from 1.5 million to $600,000 to reflect revised estimates. As a reminder, this project was added as some leaks were detected at the Clearwell tank. We moved the fluoride tank repair from 21 to 22, and we added water system and tank design for the Eastern sector of the city in the amount of $80,000. In 23, we added water infrastructure study of $65,000. We added a water line upgrade of $3 million to the Eastern sector of the city. This project is contingent upon grant funding of 75% from the state. And finally, we removed the groundwater source evaluation of $225,000 as staff felt that this was not a priority at this time. On slide 22, we continue the review of the water fund. We added a water tank installation in the industrial sector of the city, the amount of $2 million. Again, this project is contingent upon grant funding from the state of 75%. In FY25, we have no changes. In 26, we added water line provisions of $400,000. Unscheduled, unfunded projects remain unchanged except for the addition of work in the Uniontown section of the city. This project was proposed by staff after initiating a study for funding consideration, and this is a potential candidate for ARPA. Slide 23, start with the sewer fund. Changes include in FY22, we added $150,000 provision to replace 440 linear feet of sewer line from Reservoir Street to Summerson Street. This was moved from 21 into 22. We added $80,000 for the Lyle Street to Blanford Street line replacement. This too was moved from 21 as well. And we added $164,500 for sewer design work for the Eastern portion of Stanton. In 23, we added uh, $5 million 
uh, provision for sewer line construction improvements in the eastern sector of the city. This project is contingent upon funding from the state in the amount of 75%. On slide 24, we report no changes to FY24 and 25. And in 26, we added a $2 million provision for Lewis Creek sewer upgrade, which was moved from the unfunded unscheduled list. Changes to the unfunded and unscheduled include adding the Uniontown sewer installation. Uh, again, this was proposed by staff for possible funding consideration after the study. This too is a potential ARPA candidate. And we, we moved the Lewis Creek sewer upgrade to 26. Final fund, parking. In the parking fund, we continue to juggle projects around, but with a credit card merchant processor under contract that is compatible with the major parking control equipment vendors, we are within about 90 days or so of issuing an RFP for access control equipment at the new street lot. It's a big improvement. It's been a long time coming and we're really close. Once we're able to install our equipment, we believe we will be able to capture additional revenue, which will help us cash flow other projects. That said, year and year changes to the parking CIP. In 22, we added the new street lot access control equipment in amount of $250,000. This was moved from 21. We moved $38,000 provision for license scanner for parking enforcement to 23. We did this to ensure compatibility with the new access equipment. In 23, we added the scanner. In 24, we moved permission, provisions for resealing and maintenance repair at New Street to 25, $300,000. 25, we added that New Street. We also moved Johnson Street garage provisions for resealing and maintenance repair to 26. And we moved provisions for resealing and maintenance repair of the wharf lot to 26. In 26, we added those two provisions. I know we have a lot here and we also have about five or six staff members who can assist with questions. And if we have no questions tonight, we will bring them back the next time and they will, they will assist at that time. So you brought the whole crew with you. We, we did. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions about council? I have a question. <clears throat> Councilor Mead. Um, you mentioned several projects that were candidates for ARPA funding. Yes, ma'am. Does the, what's the total amount of those projects versus the amount of funding that we have available to us? Um, I, I will need to add that up for you, but off the top of my head, we have seven, 7.3, I'll say five. Um, uh, I, you know, so I'm gonna say at least $12 million and we have 13 million in ARPA funds. I will say at least 12 million is probably more than that, quite frankly, okay. so I'm just, and a second question, not really a question, but um, it would be helpful to me uh, to see the allocation of funding, project funding in, in the capital improvement plan by some geographical uh, oh. organization. Uh, so that for instance, wards one through five, maybe you already have it. Uh, not yet, Okay, but I will. <laughs> okay, I'd appreciate that. Uh, yep. I would like to know how much money is being allocated on a ward by ward basis. I will do that. Any additional questions? Oh, you yeah, have Councillor Claffey. Um, Phil, on the on the Middle River Regional Jail for twenty three, you got almost two million, but that's still uh, that's an earmark figure, is it not? Aren't we still in negotiation? We have a meeting coming up in uh, February. I think there is a meeting coming up February 1st where I, I think uh, jail administration would like to discuss the project further. So, so therefore this is just an earmark and it's not. This, this was a good number three weeks ago. Okay. It may not be a good number today. That's what I want to hear you say. Councillor, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's fine. Councillor Dole. Yes, thanks. Uh, I had a couple comments or questions on, on page 24 of the CIP. I noticed that the Greenways funding is listed under Parks and Rec, and, and I think that's more appropriately listed under Community Development, where bike pedestrians, paths, and those kinds of things are, because that's what the Greenways money is for. Okay. 
Um, and then on page, that's page 24, and then page 42, there's a line item undesignated 350K. Yes, ma'am. That the city council would designate what it's for, but it does have as a, a note on the side annual maintenance. Is oh. that is that really what it's limited to, or is that just no. in there? Yeah. Yeah. That was originally um, um, moving of the the IT department, but with everything being in flux, I, I changed that to undesignated, and I should have taken that note on the side out. I'll get that out. All right, thanks. Yes. All right, any additional questions or comments? I, I'd like to make a comment. Councilor Mead? Uh, that I, I see that we've added $200,000 for the installation of ADA compliant pedestrian signals at Coulter and Beverly. Was that location chosen because that's where most of the, the uh, children from the school uh, uh, for the deaf and blind uh, access the city. Is that why that was chosen or, or um, is there another reason? Uh, I believe council had, had mentioned this uh, during last year's CIP project uh, process uh, and I made notes. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have a question uh, concerning the um, new street lot access and control equipment. I don't know, Mr. Trayer, if you can answer this, but can you describe the equipment? Um, it's going to be 24-hour, 24, 24 uh, seven-day-a-week access equipment. Um, we're, we're putting together the specifications of that unit right now. Um, um, probably going to have um, um, credit card accessibility at that location. I don't know whether we're gonna go so far as to have phone app associated with it, but uh, um, we're, we're still putting together the specs now. Parking um, seems pretty cut and dry, but when you sit down with Mr. Plowman, it, it suddenly becomes very complicated as, <laughs> as he thinks of all sorts of things that I don't normally think of. So um, we, we are putting those, those specs together and, and we do anticipate having an RFP out uh, within the next 90 days. Okay, all right, thank you. Bill, I, I saw, uh, are you looking to, to replace the water line at, uh, at, at right at the intersection of Greenville and, and uh, down here at the junction? Potentially. That, potentially. Yeah, that, that uh, associated with the uh, um, um, Greenways project, uh, the sidewalk project, and, and, and if we were going to do a entryway sidewalk project, streetscape project, um, if we were going to tear up sidewalks, we would replace lines underneath there at the same time. I know that we got a thing saying that there wasn't as many water breaks. I mean, I think maybe just because they happen around my place that I noticed some more. Yes, they do, <laughs> sir. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, that, I think that, that area, I don't know, seems prone to water breaks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank it. you to your crew, to everyone for coming out this evening. Well, it's truly a team effort. I oh, will tell no you that doubt. they're great. No doubt. Um, a lot of really good information. So thank you. Yeah. All right. So the next item is item number three, a discussion of ordinance to appropriate an additional 25% of the FY 2022 adopted budget. Mr. Rosenberg. Mr. Chair will present this item as well. Welcome back, Mr. Trayer. <laughs> it's good to be back, Madam Your Mayor, members of council. <laughs> yes, well, first two items, thank goodness. Okay, tonight we're here for an additional budget appropriation request on our FY 2022 adopted budget. As you're aware, in response to the uncertainty of the economy and potential impact on the city's 2022 revenues, the city's budget was appropriated at a level of 75% to allow staff to access the impact the volatile economy was having on our revenues as the fiscal year unfolded. Revenues continue to flow into the city at a level to meet our FY 2022 budget requirements. Local taxes of interest to report at this time, so meals tax through October up $374,000 at the same time last year, and we're projecting to finish upwards of $850,000 above budget projections. 
Sales tax through September is up 133,000 over same time last year. And we're trending at about half a million above budget projections and lodging tax through October is up 188,000 at same time last year. And, and we're trending at about 327,000 above budget projections. Um, in addition, real estate, personal property tax, business occupational tax are all set to meet budget projections. Given these overall positive variances, we feel comfortable with appropriating the final 25% of the FY 2022 budget at this time, bringing the total FY 2022 adopted budget appropriation to 100%. The appropriation request equals 32,794, does not require a public hearing as one was held during the budgeting process on the full budget amount. City portion of the budget appropriation equals 22,665. The school portion, 10,128,000. Details have been summarized here in your packet. Uh, uh, includes general fund 15.4, debt service 1.4 million, Blue Ridge Court services 307,000, capital improvement 245,000. Uh, water fund 2.9 million, sewer fund 990,000, parking fund 128,000, stormwater fund 414,000, environmental fund 816,000, total city 22,665. Education fund, we have 8.8 .8 million, cafeteria 424,000, textbook fund 69,000, school capital improvement 25,000, and state operator programs. 797,000 total school, 10,128,000 total appropriation, 32,794. And this ordinance will be brought back before council for consideration at our January 27th, 2022 regular meeting. And the city manager recommends its introduction as presented. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, Mr. Rosenberg, we need a motion on this for the. Uh... Reduction of the ordinance. That's, that's correct. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Councillor Mead. I move to introduce an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2022 budget by adding an additional 25% of the FY 2022 adopted budget in an amount equal to $32,764,216. There's a typo. Typo. There is. Did you catch that? It yeah. should say 32,794,000. million seven hundred ninety-four. Mm. I'm sorry, that was my fault. I'll amend okay. my motion uh, to be cor the correct amount at thirty-two million seven hundred ninety-four thousand two hundred sixteen dollars. I have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? That mayor, I'll second that. Right. Councillor Claffey is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. The motion carries. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Traeger. Next item is item number four on the work session and item B on the regular meeting agenda is a discussion of ordinance amending, restating, and reordaining section 12.35.010, establishment of city market location, deleting sections 12.35.030, rules and regulations, 12.35.040, fees, and 12.35.060, certificate required of chapter 12.35. 35 city market of title 12 streets, sidewalks and public places of the Stanton city code. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. City Attorney John Blair will present this item. Welcome, Mr. Blair. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, tonight before you at the work session and during the regular meeting, you will have the opportunity to vote on some amendments to the city code that reflect practices of the city market, um, whereas your ordinance has lagged behind those actual practices. The current city code was adopted years ago and it envisioned and perhaps operated 
I think this was before our time here as a complete public entity. The market was managed by a city employee and the fiscal affairs were superintended by the city. Um, as the years have evolved, uh, this has become more of a market driven, and, and that's perhaps the wrong word, but a, a private nonprofit driven entity rather than a city entity. And last year, after some leadership changes in the city market, the city manager and I met with the Stanton Farmers Market Committee at that time and asked them, um, you know, we went over what had been going on practically rather than is reflected in the ordinance. We also talked to them about operating the market and they agreed and they have now they are now they formed a nonprofit corporation called the Stanton Farmers Market, and they're pursuing tax exempt status as what's called a 501c5, which is a nonprofit agricultural group. Um, before you tonight, the ordinance would reflect that the city manager would now have the authority to contract with this, with this group or another not-for-profit corporation to operate the city market, the city manager would have to approve all the rules and regulations of the market. Therefore, that helps protect the city's interest in terms of producer certificates, fees, and other aspects of the market the city would still have some authority to look at the proposed rules and regulations and would have to approve them before the market operated. And it also, um, again, reflects more of the actual practice than what um, the ordinance indicates, which again is more of a city operated market. So this is um, right now for the work session and City manager and I are, are here to answer any questions you may have about these proposed ordinance amendments. And I'd ask the city manager if he had anything he'd like to add. I have one, just one additional um, piece of information to share with you all. Historically, um, the city has not had insurance coverage um, other than its own for the operation of the market. And there's been a requirement that each individual vendor sign and submit a hold harmless uh, in favor of the city at the beginning of every market season. With, the, with this restructured arrangement and the incorporation of this entity, the Stanton Farmers Market, our agreement with that corporate entity will require it to indemnify and hold harmless the city and to back that indemnification and hold harmless with commercial general liability insurance, naming the city as an additional insured, which affords the city much more protection, I suggest to you, than the individual hold harmless documents that have been submitted by individual vendors over the years. So I think that that's a significant added protection to the city associated with the restructuring of the relationship. All right, are there any additional questions? That was my question. I was just wondering if they would pay the interest. Councilor Dole? Yes, um, with this new arrangement, are we running afoul of any kind of state procurement um, uh, policies or laws because it's no longer a city operated market or even though maybe it practically wasn't but by doing this is it something that we'd have to rfp in the future well councillor dole and and i'll take the first stab at this um this in terms of procurement policies themselves Certainly the city can in future years do an RFP, but considering that the value here, um, it would fall within the city's small purchase procedures 
And th those procedures for an amount like this, which is, uh, again, while they may be receiving the opportunity to um, operate on the west side of the wharf parking lot, it would not require more than the city soliciting one bid. So it would not run afoul of our current small purchase procedures, though in future years, the city could issue an RFP if it chose. Well, thanks. Well, well, let's hope everyone sees it that way. All right, are there any additional questions, comments? Hearing none, that takes us to break. We will be on break until 6.30. So we'll see everybody back at 6.30. Okay, we're back from break. And the next item is item number five, a discussion of Shenandoah Valley Animal Services Center. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this item was first requested by Council Member Dahl um, to be included on your work session agenda for December. And at my request, um, Council Member Dahl agreed to defer the item to this meeting um, in large part because of the mm -hmm. um, the large number of items that were already on your December meeting agenda. So um, what I would like to do, um, it may be that um, Ms. Dole has some uh, particular items that she would like to discuss, but uh, Council Member Dole, I'm prepared to provide um, an update on some of the matters concerning the shelter, if that's your pleasure at this time. Uh, sure, that, that would be fine. And then if I have any additional comments, I can make them afterwards. Very well, thank you. Um, so um, council members may recall receiving an email from council member Dole on November 14th that addressed certain items related to the Shenandoah Valley Animal Services Center or the shelter as we refer to it. And I'll cover those as well as some additional items that have arisen um, over the course of the past um, month and a half or so. Um, Ms. Dole had suggested in her November 14th email that the city might assume the role of the fiscal agent for the shelter and essentially take over its management. Um, I'll share with you that um, presently, the three localities in the region divide the role. Um, we divide the regional agencies and each, um, each one of us assumes the role as fiscal agent for various regional agencies. So presently, uh, Waynesboro is the fiscal agent for the Office on Youth and, uh, and uh, Shenandoah Valley Animal Services Center. Um, Stanton is the fiscal agent for Blue Ridge Court Services and recently assumed the responsibility for Valley Alcohol Safety Action Program. And Augusta County is presently um, the fiscal agent for Shenandoah Valley Social Services and Middle River Regional Jail. Uh, so, um, and I'm sorry, Waynesboro is also the fiscal agent for CAPSAW. So uh, Waynesboro is presently the fiscal agent for three regional agencies, Stanton two and Augusta County two. There has been some preliminary discussion of a shift of the Animal Services Center to either Augusta County or Stanton. We, the managers, uh, make a concerted effort to evenly divide the responsibility for these regional agencies. And with some increased staffing at Middle River Regional Jail, soon the jail authority will assume its own fiscal management. So the county will cease to be the fiscal agent for the authority. A shift of the Animal Services Center to the county would then result in an even balance of responsibility among the three localities for regional agencies at two each. 
And I anticipate that discussion of these possibilities will continue amongst the managers for the three localities. Let me talk about the status of the, outsour the outsourcing proposal. Um, as you recall, a request for proposals had been made by the city of Waynesboro, the, the fiscal agent for the center. Two proposals have been received in response to the request for proposals uh, for, the, for operating the center. And to remind council and the public, the next step is for an evaluation committee comprising representatives of each of the three localities to review any proposals received and make a determination whether to begin contract negotiations with one of the interested parties deemed most qualified, including at that point negotiations about cost. So up until this point, there's been no, um, no um, exchange concerning the possible cost of a contract to operate. And that's consistent with the procedures under the Virginia Public Procurement Act. So the evaluation committee has the proposals, they're presently scoring them, and the com that committee will subsequently meet as a group to review and rank the proposals as required by the Procurement Act. And I will update you again once that has occurred. Uh, Ms. Dole in her email also um, talks about increases for staff compensation at the shelter. And I will tell you that on a parallel track with the procurement effort and as a possible alternative to outsourcing the operation of the center, Waynesboro is working on possible changes to the center's compensation structure, as well as possible increases in the authorized number of positions at the center. And I expect that the owner's representatives, including me, will receive and review those suggestions addressing both short-term and long-term considerations at an upcoming meeting. Any of these changes that we make to the compensation structure or to the number of authorized positions will result in a change in the city's annual contribution to the center's operation, which is presently $95,000 for the current fiscal year. Ms. Dole also uh, proposed the establishment of a shelter advisory commission. And I have shared with my counterparts this suggestion. And I expect that it too will be discussed at an upcoming meeting uh, um, of, the, uh, of the management group. There have recently been some communications about a veterinarian for the shelter, the, the prior veterinarian ended her service uh, to the center as of the end of the calendar year. And when we're talking about a municipal shelter, a veterinarian serves two purposes. One purpose is to serve as the supervising veterinarian to allow the center to possess and use drugs on site. The other purpose is to provide veterinary care to the animals held at the center. The city of Waynesboro has issued two procurement solicitations and in addition sought to directly hire a veterinarian as an employee to address both of these needs. None of these efforts has yet been successful. Waynesboro is presently exploring a temporary partnership with other shelters operated by local governments in the region to meet these immediate needs. In addition, my counterparts and I are reaching out to individuals in our personal and professional networks to make the, the veterinary professionals in the region aware of the need and to seek assistance. For example, I have provided contact information to Waynesboro City Manager Mike Camp for an officer of the Blue Ridge Veterinary Medical Association, a local association of veterinarians in the region as a possible source of interested practitioners. In short, all three localities are applying effort to resolve this situation. There's been some communication about the status of the kennel manager, and I can't delve into personnel details, uh, but there will be a need for a temporary kennel manager at the Animal Services Center for a period of time in the coming months. 
The city of Waynesboro posted a recruitment for this position to address this imminent staffing need and received several applications. As of today, the position has been filled effective as of Monday, January 17th. The unsuccessful candidates will be encouraged to consider open part-time kennel attendant positions. There have also finally been some communications about maintenance needs at the shelter. And in particular, Council Member Dole forwarded an email from a supporter of the shelter detailing specific items that had not been addressed. I conferred with city, city manager Mike Camp about that particular list. And he, he tells me that most of the needs identified in the email sent to you all earlier this week had not been previously reported to the city of Waynesboro. The city manager has assured me that he is fully prepared to address the maintenance needs of the center as he has made aware of them. The owner's representatives, including me, will meet with the center staff in the coming days, and we will encourage them to promptly inform the city when conditions arise requiring attention so that we can meet those needs. And that completes my update, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions that Ms. Dole or any other members of council may have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Holmes. Did they, uh, the gal that was running the kennel, is she gone? Is that what I understand? There, what I can tell you is that there will be a temporary need. So there's a shelter manager position that's vacant. The shelter director position is vacant presently. There's also a kennel manager and the kennel manager will require um, temporary, uh, you know, a, a temporary replacement. So the expectation is that the present kennel manager will return after a, a temporary absence. Oh, okay. So I believe that the position listing was for a 14 week period during which somebody would serve in a temporary capacity. Councillor Claffey. Uh, Stevie, if the Stanton portion is $95,000. Yes, sir. How much is the total budget? Is it split evenly about three or does Gusta County pay more? Or how um, does that work? It, I don't believe that it's split Evenly, Mr. Claffey, with a lot of these regional arrangements, um, it, it's there's a convoluted formula, and I don't know the formula for this particular um, operation off the top of my head. But it may be that it's a portion of it is divided equally, a portion of it is divided based on population, and a portion of it is divided based on the number of cases related to each locality. It's that has been a fairly common methodology of allocating the expenses among the three localities for these regional operations. But I can't tell you with certainty that that's the case for this one. Has the $95,000 figure been constant over the last five years or? Um, is it Mr. Chair, um, I don't believe that it has been. I, I, I think that there've been changes to it as there are with all of our operations. Yeah, all right, thank you. Nothing, uh, you know, nothing out of the ordinary, however. Thank you. All right, Councillor Dole. Yes, uh, you know, I brought this uh, and, and requested it be on the agenda because we have um, Stanton residents who were really, really concerned about, um, you know, it's gone from having problems to having worse problems to having, you know, they're in crisis mode. And granted, uh, if, if the maintenance issues, which was the dishwasher was broken, the dryer was broken, and half of the lights were burnt out. But if there's only one full-time staff and a part-time staff, you know, it's like they, they, it, they were overwhelmed with uh, the work of, of caring for the animals. Uh, and and the director's position's been uh, vacant for months and months. I don't know the exact amount of time, but in in every case, the the folks who talked to us and you you'll recall a few meetings back there were people there were people that came and talked in matters from the public, but without exception, they they wanted Stanton to be the fiscal agent and to be in charge. And 
on the one hand, I think that's flattering because our our citizens trust us to do a good job. And they also say that Waynesburg's had it for all, the number of years since it was created. And why not give them a break? And, you know, I think we could, we could take over this shelter and give them one of the other things that we're currently fiscal agent for. Uh, if, if it's a requirement that it be two for each uh, locality. Um, and clearly the staff in, in total were underpaid. Um, the director position was getting, uh, I, I wanna say it was 36,000 a year. And that's for a 24 seven operation. That, that's you know a lot of responsibility for not a lot of money. And then the, the part-time helper making way far less than what you can make at a, any a burger joint. So, you know, and, I, and this is not the first time we, through the years, we would, we would have um, in our budget, we would say that uh, our employees would get like, um, I don't know, a 3% raise or whatever we decided that year. And we thought that that was translating to those employees, but it didn't. They went years and years with no increase at all. And I would just like to make sure that, that they're getting the support financially and staff-wise that they need to, to run an operation that really truly is known throughout the state uh, for, for the good work it's done in creating a virtually no kill shelter other than those who are diseased or injured so badly they need to be euthanized uh, and finding homes for, for these pets. So that's why I brought it up. And, I, and you know, I would like to see us be proactive and not let this be an out of sight, out of mind um, thing that we take, make sure that we're, uh, we're running a shelter we can be proud of. Are there any additional comments or questions? Well, I'd be interested in hearing from the rest of counselors uh, what you think about uh, the, the current situation and, and how you feel about us improving it. Well, I do have a question for Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, the committee, setting up the committee, now what did you say about um, Mike Hemp, Mr. Hemp? Um, the advisory commission? Or the, yes. or the evaluation committee. No, 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 um, the advisory commission. Um, I think that um, I, I shared with you all that I have passed that suggestion on to Mr. Fitzgerald and Mr. Hamp, who are the other two owner's representatives. And uh, I, I believe that there's a, a, a willingness to consider that. And I expect that we'll discuss it at an, at an upcoming meeting. Mayor Oaks. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Councillor Dole, I agree with you. I, I think that, that you're spot on as far as uh, your assessment of the situation. And, and, you know, so I support everything that you said because I think it is important. Um, I think, you know, unless I hear otherwise, I'm not sure why we could not look at the potential of switching, you know, regional programs or whatever that we need to do. Um, and, and really try to get in there and make a difference and keep this this um, program going because it does do really good work. Yeah, Councilor Holmes. As long as we're not stepping on somebody else's toes, but have they have they added any help to this to, to the to to the shelter? Have they been able to hire any? you know, just handlers, just people to help. That they're, they're facing the same situation as any other employer um, in the current environment, Mr. Holmes. And that's why I, I've described to you that, you know, that we're taking a look at the compensation structure for the existing employees and the addition of new employees. But it, in order for that to succeed, it will need to be at a higher level of compensation. And that's the discussion that we're having. How many employees do they have now, full and part-time? Um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll have to get you that, that information. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. And Carolyn, I, I too would support that. Uh, I'm a big animal lover. Unfortunately, I don't have a dog right now. And uh, 
Um, but I, I know where you can get one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> with with my current job status and everything else, I, it's I'm not sure it's fair to the dog or the cat. But um, so I would be in favor. We've got a lot of our community. I know uh, they came up and expressed so uh, that absolutely are big big animal lovers, and uh, I'd be in I'd be in full support of us. You know if. Waynesboro, Augusta County is willing to trade off or whatever. Uh, I'd be more than willing to, um, you know, us take over that particular facility. And if we have to increase, at least make it worth somebody's while to come work there, I, I don't have a problem with that. Wouldn't all three entities have to decide to increase? It would have to be, I mean, just we couldn't just increase and right. You know, um, we, we could take the lead. And set the example and set the bar. I just got a new cat. I can't take another one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely in favor of uh, adding to the financial contribution. I, I think $95,000 for a, a, an outfit that size is, is an excellent deal. For, well, it's too good a deal to be true. So we probably need to pay a little bit more for it. So feel free when you go to negotiate with them to. Uh, <laughs> You know, understand that you have our backing for additional funds as needed. And, and, and I, I would just say, you know, that I, I have been since the middle of November and I continue to be fully engaged on, on these issues um, as evidenced by, you know, uh, uh, you know, our meeting, our upcoming meeting um, sometime in the next few days with shelter staff. Um, to make sure that their concerns are heard by us directly. And I will continue to stay engaged and work with my counterparts to address and resolve these issues. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. And um, I too agree. Um, let's, um, let's be the leader on this one. Let's take a look at that advisory committee and um, really move forward with having this committee put in place and to also um, consider giving more financially because um, you know, the animals in the community, I mean, <laughs> they don't have a voice. And so we need, to, we need to be the ones to make sure that they are properly cared for, which they are given so much tender love and the staff needs to be rewarded for all of the love that they give towards the animals. So let's see what we can do to help out financially. All right, all right. thank you all. All right. Moving on to item number six, a discussion of reconsideration of memorandum of understanding between County of Augusta and City of Stanton concerning Stanton and Augusta County Courts and related resolution of City Council. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, this item is on your agenda this evening at the request of Council Member Mead and I will defer to her. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. On our December 9th meeting, uh, Council voted to suspend any, any conversations about the um, uh, memorandum of understanding and the resolution to support uh, legislation that would be proposed so that Augusta County could uh, uh, accelerate the date of a referendum in the county from 2026 to 2022. Uh, that referendum would give their voters the option of either Having a removing their courthouse from the city of Stanton uh, and and um, building a new courthouse in Verona or or in Augusta County, uh, or keeping the courthouse in Stanton and renovating the facility. Uh, as as I thought about, you know, a couple of weeks after that uh, vote, it made less and less sense to me uh, that that we would defer taking a position until after Augusta County held its referendum. At that point, we, we would have no leverage. They would have no reason to offer to uh, uh, sell us those buildings, the, the three buildings, the, the uh, parking lot and the historic home. There would be no reason for, for them to consider uh, selling those facilities to us for a dollar each. Uh, they, they would probably be willing to sell them to us if, they, if the citizens of Augusta County voted to move the courthouse, they'd probably be willing to sell them to us at market value, maybe. 
But uh, as I said, it made less and less sense. And so on December 28th, I sent an email to all members of city council suggesting that we have a special meeting. And, 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 and in, 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 in the interim, it, it was obvious that many, many questions uh, were in the community. There were rumors, there were unfounded uh, speculation, there was hyperbole, there was uh, you name it uh, during that period of time. And I just felt it was important that we address those questions that citizens had. Uh, and so I asked for a special meeting. Uh, I suggested that would be important for us to do to give citizens the opportunity to ask those questions and for there, there to be responses. Uh, in our usual public comment period, we, uh, we notify uh, the speakers that they can talk, but we're not gonna respond. We're not gonna engage in back and forth uh, that's not uh, the purpose of the public comment section. So I wanted to do something a little bit different. In fact, I wanted to do something a lot different. Uh, I would have asked the city manager to make a presentation. I would have asked the city attorney to add his thoughts. And then we would have given the public the opportunity to get answers to their many questions. I, I will be the first to say that some of those questions don't have solid answers at this moment in time. But, uh, but and, I, and I'm perfectly fine uh, with, with telling folks, yeah, we, we don't have the exact answer to that question. Uh, I, I'm not afraid to, uh, I'm not afraid to, to tell people I don't know when I don't know. And I don't think our staff are afraid to tell people that either. So, uh, so I, I asked that we have that special meeting. I, I, uh, uh, I offered the mayor the opportunity to, uh, to conduct that, to call that special meeting. And, and, but I said that if she was not, if she didn't feel it was appropriate, uh, that I would join with two other members of city council and, and uh, offer our citizens that opportunity to speak and to hear and, and, and to learn. Uh, and, and so I, I did that, um, uh, it, from it, the, the, the meeting date that I proposed was January the 11th. Um, uh, we, we didn't receive any notice from any members of council that they were not going to attend that meeting. Uh, uh, Carolyn Dahl, uh, as she normally does and has been doing throughout the pandemic, notified us that she would be attending via the Zoom platform. But no other members of council notified uh, or, or stated that they were not going to attend that meeting. And, and so the meeting, the, me, the night of the meeting came, Tuesday night, there were three members of council present here for that meeting and Carolyn Dahl on the Zoom platform. At our, our attorney has advised us that in order to have a quorum, four people must be physically present in city council chambers or, or at this address in order for there to be a, a, an official meeting. And so when it became obvious that, uh, that the special meeting had been boycotted by three members of city council, we were unable to conduct that meeting. Uh, we cut off the Zoom platform and staff exited the room to the surprise, frankly, of the many people who were in city council chambers and, 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 the, and, the, and a great deal of disappointment and frustration and some anger. So, so I, I wanted this on the agenda tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a motion. I move that Stanton City Council, that our January 13th, 2022 regular meeting agenda include the following items. A presentation by the city manager and city attorney and a public input session, including the public's questions of city council on the possible relocation of Augusta County's courts and the city's possible acquisition of the county's vacated court facilities and a reconsideration of the memorandum understanding 
between the County of Augusta and City of Stanton concerning Stanton and Augusta County Courts and related resolution of City Council. I propose that that item be added to, not, to tonight's agenda, agenda as item E. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Eric, I'd also like to add the fact that- um, Are you seconding it? I'm going to second it, yes. Okay, yeah. well, the discussion will come next, okay. so- I'll second it. Okay, so Councillor Holmes is second. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Holmes, did you want to give your discussion now? Oh, no, I was just going to say that I was, I was on the fence with this at the, the meeting and Amy said, well, let's table this. And, and I said, okay, but I thought we were just going to table it for a short while, not till after the election, which like Brenda said, I think would be, it would really take any uh, advantage that we have in dealing with the way. And uh, I don't, for us, I don't see that it's a, a, a I think it's a win-win situation for us because the county doesn't get permission to uh, move the courthouse. They're going to have to put it here. But if they do, we get these properties for nothing. And and with the, with the uh, district court, push comes to shove, we could tear it down. And that property become, could come, a, it could come a tax producing piece of property, whereas now it produces no taxes, the courthouse produces no taxes. And, and we could redo the historic courthouse, but I, I just, I just, I really do think that it was, I think that we made the wrong choice that night. And, I, and that's what I want to say. Thank you. And is there any further discussion? Madam Mayor. Councilor Claffey. I was uh, interested to see that our delegate of Oli presented legislation yesterday at uh, in Richmond for the referendum. And uh, Senate Hanger has done so as well. And I believe one of the reasons why the tabling came up was the fact that Augusta County had told us that they did not need our permission to proceed and that was part of the memorandum of understanding that we were to support them in this, but they were proceeding regardless. And their, their intent, they're in Richmond today. We have two bills down there. They came about with, without any input from the city of Stanton. And I think Augusta County has shunned all support from the city of Stanton in this has never asked us for our input, and then came about and said, here's five pieces of property you can have for a dollar a piece. Take them off our hands. We already know from the judge that they are in an unacceptable condition because he's saying we have to fix them. That's why we have a show calls paper served to us because we have unacceptable buildings. And whoop de doo here we are offering them a dollar a piece for them. And the parking lot is four foot above the floodplain. The historic residence is unoccupied. The 6 East Johnson building where our juvenile and domestic court building is, is in atrocious shape. And that's why we have the show calls and why we have to improve. And then there is the jail, and that is an absolute disgrace. And about the only thing that can be said positive about that is maybe we can tear it down. But if Augusta County is going to unload their undesirable properties, and notice I did not include the courthouse, because I agree the courthouse is a very valuable piece of property. But the stuff across the street that they're trying to unload with that courthouse is less than desirable. If we're going to get it, we should be getting additional monies coming in from the county to take the jail down, to repair the juvenile and domestic building, the 6 East Johnson Street address to acceptable standards or possibly tear it down, as was just mentioned. The residents, I don't know what you're going to do because it's currently unoccupied. Nobody sees the value of uh, 
of having it. So that's why we're tabling until the legislator decides what they're going to do about this. I'm not convinced that the legislature is going to approve another referendum. And, and we don't know. And it's we're not even going to get an opportunity to vote in it. We have to wait until Augusta County votes. So that was why the table was set for November the 10th. If they can pull this referendum off and it comes out of the legislature and the governor signs that there's a third possible piece in the legislature, then it let the citizens of Augusta County decide. I found it interesting that this last proposal says it's binding. Well, how binding was the referendum they held in 2016? As soon as, as soon as the 2016 vote was set and it was turned down by the Augusta County citizens by a two to one margin, their board of supervisors started making plans to move to the courthouse. They paid absolutely no attention to the referendum. So I'm a little, I'm a, I have a slightly different view of this thing. I don't want to see that Augusta County Courthouse fall into disrepair or be lost to the city. It's a very valuable piece of property in, in our history. It is part of our historical heritage. The stuff across the street is not. And I think we're being saddled with Augusta County's cast-offs. Therefore, I vote that we table this thing until November and renegotiate November, just like was originally proposed. This is Brenda Mead. Uh, yes, I'd me. like to respond uh, to a couple of things. First, uh, the buildings are not adequate for their current purpose. They are not adequate uh, as, uh, as um, facilities for courthouse operations for a variety of reasons, for security, for, uh, for telecommunications. There are a variety of reasons why those buildings are not adequate from the court's perspective. That doesn't mean that they're, that they are, you can lump them, you can at least the district court building, for instance, you can't simply say that it's a, it, that it's a, uh, a building that is beyond redemption. Uh, there may be other ways to use that building. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, the residence was purchased by Augusta County when their plans included expanding uh, that, uh, that uh, location. And that, uh, that house is empty because Augusta County hasn't got a tenant in it. And, and why, would they? why would they? Why would they take that on uh, when their intention is to uh, ultimately dispose of it in some way. In fact, I'm surprised they haven't put a for sale sign on the building yet. But that 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 is a it, it's a lovely home, uh, and uh, and it has uh, it, it, and it would it's probably uh, I think Augusta County paid three hundred three hundred fifty thousand for it, and and with the way real estate prices are and the location it is, I think it would be a good asset for us to own. The jail is a piece of crap. I, I, I won't deny that. Uh, I, I've, I've uh, asked for estimates as to what it would cost to just demolish those buildings and, and, uh, and it's not an unreasonable number. I think when you look at the cost of the demolition of the buildings out at Stanton Crossing, uh, and I know uh, Frank Strassler is back there giving me the evil eye because I'm talking about de demolishing his favorite mid-century modern uh, monstrosity, but so, so those are two important points. I, I'd also like to read to you, it's not long, I'd like to read to you what, and, 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 and uh, Augusta County didn't say they were gonna move forward with their legislation, regardless of what the city of Stanton wanted to do. Senator Hanger and Delegate Avoli said they were going to propose this legislation, whether or not Stanton supported it. So I think that's an important distinction as well. Let me read to you uh, from uh, the, the bills that have been filed or the, uh, and they're both, they're pretty much identical. Uh, 
that it would allow Augusta County to hold a referendum on the courthouse removal in 2022, despite the 10 year waiting requirement. If two new plans are developed for either the construction and removal of the courthouse from the city of Stanton, if the rent referendum passes or renovation and expansion of the courthouse in the city of Stanton, if the referendum fails. So that's number one. Number two, the plans have to be made available to the public at Augusta County and the city of Stanton at least three months prior to the planned date of the referendum. Item three, the plan for the courthouse remaining in Stanton, if it prevails, shall be a mutual agreement between the city of Stanton and Augusta County. A mutual agreement. That is one of the items in this legislation. And finally, the result of the referendum shall be binding and the corresponding plan shall be implemented. And I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Mr. Blair uh, tell us what binding uh, legislation or, or a binding referendum might mean, if you might, if you would. Um, I, I certainly can. Um, the intent of binding, I believe, is to say that Augusta County can hold this referendum in November, but whatever the voters choose, the plan will have to be implemented. And binding means they will have to follow through and either build a new facility in Verona or renovate a, the existing facility here in Stanton. Now, the one caveat I would put to that is just like with city council actions, um, legislative actions can always be reversed. It would require another special act of the assembly, but, but I don't think I would be accurate if I didn't bring that point up. When somebody hears binding, they may say, lock clad, never, no possibility whatsoever of anything ever changing. And, you know, just like the city council, the Virginia General Assembly does have the ability to reverse a decision it makes as well, so. Thank you. All right, any additional comments? All yes, right. this is Carolyn Dole. Uh, Councilor Dole. My interest in this motion is because our, our citizens don't have all the facts because all of this negotiation and all this information went back and forth either through uh, negotiating teams that didn't warrant public meetings and or closed meetings. And that's why we have such misinformation and lack of information out amongst our citizens. I think it's really important at a minimum to have this public hearing. And in fact, if we can make it where they can ask questions and they will be answered uh, to the, uh, uh, you know, if we have the information so that everyone in the city that wants to know knows the facts. I think that's really important. Vice Mayor Robertson. All right, <clears throat> I reckon I'm an odd man out. I will, um, as y'all know, I voted, uh, I was the one that voted no. Uh, I will have to apologize to both sides of the dais here because I got off work this afternoon late and came in here and really didn't have a lot of chance to talk to either one of you. Um, after having giving it given it a lot of thought ever since the other night uh, I listened to something Miss Mead told and we did talk a little bit about it and she says listen it's important for us to listen to what the citizens say I had quite a few people come up and talk to me after I see several faces out there that did that My phone has burned up, literally, um, ever since this thing has been over from the other night. I have been cursed at 
by people on both sides of this issue. Um, words I can't and won't say, but you know, it's the citizens' right if they want to yell at us, they can do that. But I will tell you, after taking all of it in, thinking hard about it, I had an email that I read, there's been plenty, but I had an email, I reckon that, that hit me hard. And, you know, it, it said, a dollar's a good deal until it's not. You know, if it's, the property's not worth it, that's another thing. So I will tell you point blank that I am in favor of having a public hearing in regular order. And that's important when I say regular order. I don't want to create a creature that this council has never done. The citizens need to learn exactly what has been going on behind closed doors learn what we've been talking about. I mean, they need to know this. Having said that, I will not be voting to, for this motion. I want to have a public meeting, but I will not be waiting at, to voting for it at this time. I want us to learn as much as we can before we make that decision. I'm sorry to both sides. I, I know that I have not been able to talk to you, but I feel, you know, I, I felt that I need to explain to my council members, um, you know, my side. So um, I hope you'll forgive me for that, but that's my position right now. Hey, I would like to state that um, by tabling it, it was simply done to obtain more information because despite the closed meetings, um, the city council still even today has many questions right along with the citizens. So we need time to obtain more information, to get answers to those questions. We need to consider the history, the county seat being in Stanton. We need to consider the unknown cost if we were to take ownership of the buildings. How will that affect our taxpayers? We need to consider the fact that we do want to have public hearings. However, we want to have proper public hearings in which we've been able to provide additional information. Now, as far as the uh, special called meeting, uh, the email that we received, that meeting was already established because there was a date, time, and place already um, put out there. So it was not a refusal to call a special called meeting by the mayor. It was already called by three council members. I, I beg to differ. Um, I, I've got the floor. Called. I've got the floor. It had Councillor not been Mead. Called. Councillor I Mead. You, Councillor Mead. I have the floor. You're out of order. I've got the floor. Then I'll take the floor. All right. No, 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 no. Councillor Mead. You, you've already after established a time, place, and date. It was already called. I've got the floor. I've got the floor. This is tabling. It is a benefit for Stanton. We are here to serve Stanton first and foremost, and we need to take that seriously. We are here to listen to the citizens, but to do so by providing the citizens with research, with studies, with information, provide the citizens with information, and then have proper public hearings so we can hear what the citizens want to do with this most valuable history that we have right here in the city of Stanton. I will be voting no um, concerning this motion. Ms. Cormier. Cormier. This is Carol and Dahl. Okay, call the roll. This is right. Carol and Dahl. No, 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 you're not recognized. Counselor, Counselor um, Darby. I, I would like to say something. Everybody else has had their chance. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I made the motion to table this and Mr. Claffey, the way he explained it is correct. And, you know, I'm sorry if it was confusing to the citizens because that was not the intent. The intent was to table this matter. 
we had had our delegate John Avoli sit in front of us in this chamber and say he was going to take the legislation to basically overturn a 2016 referendum to the General Assembly, regardless of what this council thought or did. And that was when he was asked the question by Councillor Mead. And so, you know, my concern is that this may be a great deal for Augusta County, but I'm not convinced that this is a great deal for the citizens of Stanton. Um, I think that by tabling it and getting more information and knowing how much, you know, it's going to cost to do anything substantial with these buildings is important because that's going to fall right on the backs of the taxpayers. And, you know, the biggest issue that I see right now for our city is we are under a show cause order to determine where our juvenile and domestic relations district court needs to be housed. That is the only true problem that we have right now regarding this whole issue. So we need to be figuring that out and focusing on where is that going to go? You know, if we, if we took, if we said, okay, this is the deal that we need to take and we go for this and we obtain these buildings, you know, we still got to figure out where to put our juvenile and domestic relations court. I think that by tabling this and working through some of these issues and informing the public better and maybe even setting up some kind of task force. You know, when I came on council, Mr. Claffey and I volunteered to be um, on a team to work with Augusta County and figure out how to, to move forward with this courthouse. And I will tell you, we that's never happened. Not one single time. There was, there was nothing. Um, and so I think we do need to slow this train down. You know, the legislation has already been filed. So whatever happens in the General Assembly happens. It's either going to make its way through and pass or it's not. So, you know, we'll know in about 60 days where we stand on that. I think that we need to, in the meantime, really look at what do we do now to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to find a suitable location for our juvenile and domestic relations court. And, and that's what our focus needs to be, as well as making sure that there is information provided to you all along the way. And if we need to set up some time, type of, you know, we talked just a second ago about a task force for the, the animal shelter. Well, maybe we set up something like that for this, where we have citizens with expertise and Mr. Strassler and, you know, someone from the bar that is going to be working in these facilities. I mean, I don't know. I think that there's just so much that we could still do that we haven't even had a chance to because every time that this whole thing comes up, it's like it hits us and make a decision now. So in my thinking, taking our time, getting our ducks in a row and doing what we need to do that's best interest of Stanton is exactly why tabling this is the right thing. And I will not support Mrs. Mead's motion. This is Carol on Dole. Councillor Dole. Can I make a correction? Um, no, no. Councillor Dole has the floor. I just want to reiterate that the our citizens, our constituents, the people that live here in Stanton do not have the information that we have. The point of the special call meeting was to give them all the information up to this point. Sure, we don't have all the answers to everything, but our citizens deserve to know what we know so far. And we could at a minimum have Mr. Rosenberg do a, a, a presentation that I'm sure he was prepared to do Tuesday night when some of you chose not to show up. And, and then we could have a public hearing, but they don't know what we know. And it's disrespectful to our citizens to, to just say, well, let's just wait and we'll do something later. Mayor Oaks. Councillor Mead. May I have the floor? Councillor Mead. Thank you. I'd just like to correct the mayor's statement that the meeting had already been called, date and time named, when I sent the email on December 28th. And I'm going to read directly, if you'll bear with me. Members of council, in response to many ongoing questions and concerns I have received from the public, I propose 
that council host a special meeting to allow the public to hear more from council members and Mr. Rosenberg about the negotiations that have taken place with Augusta County about the location of their court facilities. The agenda would include a more detailed presentation from Mr. Rosenberg on the timeline and conversations that have taken place, which led to our vote to decline to enter into the MOU presented to council at our last meeting. That would be the December 9th meeting. The agenda would also provide an opportunity for all council members to receive and respond to questions and comments from the public. In addition, we anticipate that a draft of the Hanger of Oli pre-file legislation will be available as it is now for council members to review prior to the meeting. As you know, the General Assembly convenes January 12th, which is also the next date of the Augusta County Board of Supervisors meeting. In anticipation that we are able to present the facts that our citizens need and have the proposed legislation in hand for council's review, I have asked Mr. Rosenberg to place on the agenda of the January 13th meeting a reconsideration of the council's vote regarding the decision to defer adoption of the courthouse MOU until after the November 22 election referendum, excuse me. And I quoted from council procedure memorandum number seven, 17, I beg your pardon. And I won't go through that, I won't go through that in detail, but essentially it says that either the mayor or two members of council may call a special meeting. The next paragraph, I said, in the event that the mayor declines to call the special meeting, I am prepared to do so, along with councilors Terry Holmes and Carolyn Dahl. At this time, I have reserved the council chambers for Tuesday, January 11th at 7 p.m. A minimum of three days notice is required to be given to the public, but I would prefer to allow more time. I hope that this meeting will provide more insight to our citizens and provide a clearer path to the city's future. I share your commitment to hearing from our citizens. I had not called that meeting when I asked uh, on December 28th that uh, members of council join me. Okay. I just wanted to make so sure that was- a clear. date, a time, and a place was established. I never refused. That's why, as Andrea Oaks, the citizen, had a town hall meeting. However, we need to move forward. Uh, one thing we did hear from from the citizens, we are out of time. One thing we did hear from from the citizens is slow the process down. We owe everyone due process. Um, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. No. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. No. Mayor Oaks. No. Vice Mayor Robertson. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. The motion fails. All right. Madam Mayor. Councillor Claffey. In the interest of the hearing, the, the public comment tonight, I move the council amend its regular agenda for tonight's meeting to conduct a public hearing pursuant to council procedure memorandum four on the possible relocation of Augusta County's courts to Verona, Virginia. I would like to hear what everybody has to say tonight. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I will gladly second that. Vice Mayor Robertson is second. Any further discussion? I have something to say about that. Once again, uh, we want to hear from the people, but we don't want to give people the information that they've asked for. That is the format of our hearings. There is no exchange. There are no questions and answers. It, it is simply the opportunity, again, for people to stand up and say what they think based on what they know, based on speculation, based on hyperbole, not based on facts not based on facts. All right, Ms. Um, Cormier, please call the roll. Ms. Dahl. No. Ms. Darby. Yes. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. 
Ms. Mead. No. Mr. Holmes. No. Mr. Claffey. Aye. The motion carries. All right, so that'll be item E, a public hearing concerning the courthouse issue will be added to the regular meeting agenda. Um, we are getting ready to roll right into the regular meeting. Um, is there an interest to um, not have the roll call this evening? Yes, that's fine, pass it. All right, so we're gonna um, pass on the roll call. We are now adjourned. We are supposed to be back in 30 seconds for a regular meeting. However, 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 we are going to start the meeting at 735 so we can incorporate a break and everyone can um, use the ladies and gentlemen's room. Uh, work session meeting is now adjourned.